Hello everyone, in this video here, we are going to show the dynamic models with spatial variability. In the past exam we had before, water heating problem where uh, water is contained in the beaker and heat comes from the heater underneath. Uh, we consider the whole temperature within the water body is uniform. But in fact, this might not be true. Let's consider one example where the water body is relatively long, like a cylinder and the surface is very far away from the bottom where the heat comes from and obviously the temperature would be different within the water body. There are so many other examples that um, the system cannot consider as one stock where the heat or mass is distributed uniformly within the system. The second example we can see here is that um, for a water stream, if the contaminant comes from upstream, it obviously takes quite a bit of time for the contaminant and transport from upstream to downstream and if we consider the whole stream as one stock to store the mass and contaminant it's not that accurate so we feel the urgency of consider the system by representing it by multiple stock and in between the stock there are flow to transport through this is the typical way that we need to solve the real-world problem. And there are several other examples um, displayed on the slide. Movement of contaminant from the soil, similar to the water stream. Dispersion of contaminant in the river. Routing flood in the catchment. The last one is the air dispersion, which is also a property that needs to change over time and over space. The main part of this video here is to uh, solve a problem. The problem is displayed here. So simulating heat transport to the soil. So the problem is to estimate the temperature distribution from bare soil surface to Z is equal to 0.8 below the surface. So we have the sketch here. So the very bottom here has 0.8 meters below the surface. The surface temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, which is the T surface here. And um, uh, the bottom temperature, T bottom is 15 degrees Celsius. And the heat conductivity of the box soil, lambda soil, is 2 watt per meter per degree Celsius. The soil volume heat capacity, which is the amount of uh, heat the system can take, is um, this value here. And the initial temperature is 15 degree, which is the same as the 15 degree at the very bottom. And the heat conductance between air and soil surface, which is here and that from 0.9 meters below the surface of the soil layer, which is the conductance here, is assuming to be 100. The flow equation could be calculated by the equation here. So the left-hand side is basically the speed that heat transports through the soil layer, whereas the delta S and delta Y convert that into a volumetric value. This one has got quite a few applications here. Evaporation is basically driven by heat produced from atmospheric surface. So if we can see how deep the temperature is able to transmit it down to the soil, you pretty much can estimate where the evaporation may take place. So for this problem, if we consider the whole section as one stock to store all the energy, it's not going to be distributed unevenly across. Instead, it's only one value. But that becomes very tricky because that means uh, the surface temperature is 30 degree and on the other side is 15, which is a suggestion that the temperature distribution within the domain is not going to be uniform. It has to change from 30 degree on the surface to uh, 15 degree to the bottom. And the only way to consider this is actually uh, split the whole depth into multiple layers. This is exactly what we are trying to do here. Now let's look at how we are going to solve the problem. On the left hand side we still have the original figure as we showed before. Uh, but now what we are going to do is to cut the whole Z into four sections and transpose it in a different way. If you see the Z axis it's going on this direction to the right hand side where it used to be delta z pointing down and x and y are still there so we still have delta x delta y and the z is being split by four sections so four delta z here is the same as z there so we will look at each section 
For the section one, we will have the heat storage represented by this equation. So we've got volumetric heat capacity times the volume times the temperature and the unit after the multiplication ends up with the jaw, which means that this section is a storage for energy. After the, the heat storage, we will look at the flux. So for the section one here, we've got two fluxes. One is the flux that comes in from the surface. This is driven by the temperature in the surface and the temperature at the section one. So T surface minus T1. The positive direction for the flow is actually towards the Z direction. So it is in parallel to the Z direction, not opposite to it. So assuming that if the temperature surface is greater than T1, Q1 here is actually a positive value. So the temperature difference multiplied by the heat conductance multiplied by the interface area is equal to Q in one, which has a unit of jar per second. So that's actually the inflow. Now let's look at the, the outflow. So the outflow Q out one is to describe flow moving from section one to section two. The flow is positive only if the direction is in line with the Z direction there. To be able to get that, we will calculate the temperature difference by T1 minus T2. So if T1 is higher, T2 is smaller, the flow is going in line with the Z direction and Q is going to be a positive value. And that will be divided by delta Z here, which is the distance between section one and section two. So here, although we cut the section and using an arrow in between to show the flow, the distance between the middle part of the section one to the middle part of the section two is still delta Z. That shows how far is it from the central point of the one and two. This temperature difference divided by the uh, distance will be multiplied by the heat conductivity and then the surface area in between the two. That will end up with the Q out one, right? So that's basically the flow within the section one we show here. The same thing applies to section two, which would be slightly easier as compared to the section one because Q in two, the number two represents the section two, is exactly the same as the Q out one. So basically all the energy that comes out from the section one will be accepted by the section two. So Q out one is equal to Q in two. In terms of the outflow from the section two, what we have is the the energy moving out from section two to section three. And this could only be positive if the flow is in the same direction as the Z direction. So in that case, we will have T2 minus T3. So assuming T, if T2 is greater than T3, the flow direction will be in line with the Z axis. And that will be divided by delta Z, which is the uh, distance between the central point of the two section times the lambda soil times delta X and delta Y. So this is pretty similar to the Q out from the section one. So the same thing applies to the section three uh, and also the, the inflow for the section four. In terms of the outflow from the section four, it is equal to T4 minus T bottom. Remember the direction. So it could only be positive if the outflow is in the same direction as the Z direction here. So that's the reason why it is T4 minus T bottom, not the other way around. Now, basically, we've already uh, set up all the flow equations and also the storage equations. The difference between the storage equation is that if it's section one, it's T1. If it's section two, it's T2. The rest of the parameter is almost the same. And the same thing applies to the section three and section four. Now we need to summarize. 
What is the general flow equations? The reason we need to summarize that is that we could use the for loop to calculate some of the flow equations that are in common. So the way of doing so is to do it one by one. So let's look at the Q out, all the outs, right? We've got how many outs? It's exactly the same as the number of sections we have here. So it's Q out one, Q out two, Q out three, and Q out four. Within the four Q outs, we find that this three shares a bit similarity because it's all about the flow in between the section, whereas the section four is slightly different. So in that case, we, we look at the problem into two sections. First, look at the ones that shows something in common and then look at the one that is different. So in that case, Q out one, two, three, is the one that needs to be numbered together. So in that case, we will have the space a variation changing from one to three, right? Then Q out I, I basically is the index of the sections we are looking at. So if we summarize it, when I is equal to one, the temperature here is going to be T1 minus T2. Look at the T1 and T2. If we replace one as I, then what we have is Ti minus Ti plus one, which is exactly what we described here. We can try to see whether this pattern works for the rest of the equations. So for the second equation, when I is equal to two, then here we've got T2 minus T3. So the same pattern, this is Ti minus Ti plus one. So that means the equation we have here still apply for this section. And if we try the same thing on the number three, we are still able to get the T3 minus T4 when I is equal to three. So the summarize we have it here is that once we use the for loop to calculate the Q out from one to three, we can always use Q out I is equal to lambda times Ti minus Ti plus one over delta T times X and Y. So that will make the number of outflow equation much less as compared to individually specify them out. Because remember the for loops, particularly if the number of sections could be thousands or millions, if you look at the, the finite element analysis, for example. We've already uh, finished all the sections that uh, shares a bit similarity. And the last one here, we basically single it out by copying this equation down to the list here. Now we use the very similar trick to look at the Q in. So Q in one, Q in two, Q in three, Q in four. Still, the number of the Q here is the same as the number of the section there. For the ins, we find that two, three, four shares a bit similarity because they are all the ins in between the sections. So using the same pattern, the I loop here is going to be two, three, and four which is the reason why we have it here. Then we will look at the patterns. So when I is equal to two, what we have it here is T1 minus T2. Then the T1 is literally I minus one, and the T2 is I. So the same thing applies when I is equal to three. And then we've got T I minus one, which is two minus T3 which is Ti. So we repeat the same thing. So basically as a summary, what we will specify here is that Q in I is equal to lambda Ti minus one minus Ti over delta Z and then times uh, delta X and delta Y. After we've lumped all the flows that are in common, we need to look at the boundary condition for the boundary condition here, we basically copy that equation to there. And this is basically the flow equation we need to prepare for, for the equations. And then we look at the governing equation. 
which is relatively similar to uh, the ordinary differential equation we did for the stocks. The change of the energy is equal to the Q in minus Q out. So the change of it could be considered by the storage over delta T, right? Or we move the delta T to the right hand. If we want to uh, take the delta X and take delta Y out from the Q here, you could write the volumetric flux rate to a rate, the small Q. There's one extra thing that I need to point it out, which is to convert this term into a gradient. And gradient is the direction that points to a property moving from a lower direction to a higher direction. So let's look at what the gradient will be doing. And this gradient here will later be used for calculating the, the analytical solution. So if we look at the problem, so let's say um, we have X and Y. Y could be anything. It could be the pressure. It could be the temperature. So we got two scenarios. So here we got X1, Y1, and there we've got X2 and Y2, Y2, right? In this case, because Y2 is greater than Y1, then the, the gradient is actually on this direction. Whereas for the second case, as expected, the gradient goes to the other direction. So this is still X and Y. And this one still represents X, Y, and Y1, X1 and Y1. And this one here is X2 and Y2. The gradient usually is represented by dy dx could be calculated by two ways. First way is to move it from downstream to the upstream. That is by y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Or we can calculate it from upstream to downstream. And in that case, it is y1 minus y2, x1 minus x2, right? So this is the way that how we calculate the gradient. And to justify that, let's say if y2 is greater than y1, this term here is greater than 0. And x2 obviously is greater than x1, so that is greater than 0. And then we got a result that is greater than 0, which means that the direction of the gradient is in the same direction as the x, which is a positive value. Whereas for the case here, what we have is that y2 minus y1 is a negative value, whereas x2 minus x1 is a positive value. And then it ends up with a negative gradient, which means that the increase of the property is in opposite direction of the x here. This is basically the uh, definition of the gradient and the approximation is basically the first order approximation here. So if we go back to the problem we have here, if we look at this one, what you will find is that delta z is calculated from downstream to the upstream because the original point is here. So this is downstream and this is upstream, but the t is calculated in the opposite direction because if we, if we delta z is calculated from downstream to the upstream, that means the t needs to be calculated from downstream to upstream as well. So it has to be organized in this way. And if we organize the uh, gradient in this way, we will end up with a negative symbol up front. So the advantage of this, which we will show in the later slides, is that we can represent that by dt dz. And in that case, we can further derive a governing equation. But if you just do the numerical solution, you can just use this one. So it, either this one or, or the one that, that one, and it gives you exactly the same value. But for this one, we can later on replace it to a partial derivative, and then we could potentially end up with the analytical solution. Now, let's look at how we are going to solve the problem. What is the code arrangements? 
The coding structure, first of all, is to clear everything. The reason that we need to clear everything out is because we don't want the previous simulation attempts to affect your current results. And after that, we will uh, declaring all the parameters and constants, and we will declare all the numerical parameters. So the numerical parameter are the parameters that are not used in the analytical solution. So that could be delta x, delta y, which is um, the spatial discretization. And we also need to initialize the stock. The stock would have the number of the um, cells, which is spatial discretization. And we also would have the maximum time steps. And after that, we need to specify the initial values. After specifying the initial value, we will do a for loop. Within the for loop, the first loop is going to be the time loop. And after the time loop, we will update the time dependent variable and converters. And then we will update the flow and the boundary conditions, which are the equations we show here and here, right? And after that, we need to calculate space variations, the space uh, variations of the next time step. So this part is the same as the section we have here. So that's basically the equation that we need to work on. We will open MATLAB and then try to implement the problem. So we go here, we move everything to this side so that we can still see it. And on the other side, we have the MATLAB section. Now, let's go ahead. So first of all is to clear. And the reason that we need to clear all the uh, past memory is that we don't want the new simulation being affected by the previous attempts. The next is the uh, dz underscore m is equal to 0 0.2. 0 0.2 here represents the total number of section we will have is going to be the four. So number of cells is equal to four. So in total, the length is going to be 0 0.8. And dx underscore m is the unit width that is going to be one meter. dy underscore m is equal to one as well because it's unit width as well. Time step underscore. The time step is something that a analytical solution will not be used, but for the numerical solution, it will be applied. Basically, that means the time is going to be split in multiple sections in a similar way as what we do for cutting the uh, soil depth into multiple section. In general, we don't really know where to start with the time step. The general rule is that we need to look at the boundary condition and see how the value change over time. If you're looking at daily problem, the value change daily. And in that case, your time step will be much less as compared to the daily fluctuation. So you can't really use two days to look at the problem. Instead, the starting point would be one hour or even half an hour to be able to cut the day into many sections. So in our problem here, uh, given that the T surface and T bottom are all fixed value, we basically give a very conservative time step, let's say one hour. So one hour is going to be 60 times 60, which is 3,600 seconds. The next one is going to be the maximum time steps. So max time steps. This one, let's say we simulate for 10 days. Then we have 24 times 10, right? So the 24 means that the time step is one hour and then 24 hours times 10 days. So the total time simulation time is going to be 10 days. And now let's look at the thermal conductivity. So this value needs to be equal to, according to the unit here, it's going to be two, isn't it? So that's here. And we put a uh, semicolon to suppress any outputs from the terminal. And then it is the conductance. So thermal conductance, WBM2PC, 100, right? 
Next one would be the soil volumetric heat capacity. This one is joule per meter cube per Celsius. And the number is going to be 2959200. We will use a non-capital value here. And then after that, the uh, initial condition. So first is the temperature. So temperature underscore C underscore array. This is our array is equal to zeros number of cells. The second index is going to be the time step, max time steps. By running these commands, we declare a temperature as a 2D array. The 2D array would have four rows, many time steps, and the rows here. So if we try to draw it here, it's going to be like this. So this direction here is going to be x and this is going to be time. So that will look like this. And later on what we can see is that if you want to look at the first point over time, you can basically plot in a row if you want to look at the temperature distribution at a specific time, you can look at the problem in the vertical direction at either time point, right? So that's basically how the 2D matrix is going to look at. And a TC array needs to be specified. And the same thing applies to the heat flux in and heat flux out, right? So we need to specify these two as well. Instead of this, we would have heat flux out joule per Celsius and heat flux in as well. Heat flux in, right? Okay, so after the uh, initialization of the uh, empty values here, we need to give the initial temperature to the system. And this is being specified here. Initial temperature to be 15 degree. So where is exactly the initial value? The initial value is actually the very first column. Right, so this is a initial value, this is initial value, this is initial value, and this is initial value. So to specify that to 15 degrees Celsius, what we can do is T underscore C underscore array is equal to 15. Yeah. So by doing that, you will end up with the first column as 15 to start with, right? After this, we will need to have a few boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions we will have is T surface and T bottom. So T surface Celsius is going to be 30. T bottom Celsius is equal to 15. Then what else we need to specify? The for loop. Right, so for the first for loop is going to be the time index, right? The time index is going to be equal to one times the, 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 the maximum time steps minus one. The reason that we need to have it to maximum time step minus one is because that the total number of cells here in the horizontal direction, uh, the total number of column here is equal to max time steps, right? And the one that we need to specify is actually max time steps minus one 
because the very first value has already been specified. So the for loop is actually the maximum time steps minus one. So it's here, 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 somewhere here, and all the way to the end, which is the reason why we need to minus the maximum time step by one, right? Once we got a for loop, we need to have an in, that's for sure. Then what we'll look at is basically the fluxes. And the fluxes, the flows, will be specified by the equation we have it here, right? Let's look at the outflow first. So it is for space index is equal to one, the number of cells minus one. So the number of cells is going to be four and I minus one is going to be three. So that is the same as we specify here. The reason why I don't want to change that into three is because later on, if we want to cut the sections down to say 10, I could only just do the modification here rather than touch everything in this bit so that the change of input would be done simply by changing the parameter before the for loops, which is pretty convenient. And I suggest you always do the same thing for, for that. And then we will do an end for that. And within what we have based on the equation is going to be heat flux out joule per second uh, space index time idx plus one because this is a preparation for the next time step and this is equal to thermal conductivity times T i minus T i plus one. So in that case, let's maximize that. Um, T c array space index time index minus T c array space idx plus one time idx and then another bracket then after that what we have is the delta x and delta y and divide by the delta z right so it's going to be times dx meters times dy meters divided by dz meters right so as a double check look at the the tc here the tc what we have is i plus i ti minus ti plus one is that the case yes okay so that's basically uh the heat flux out and then we will have the t flux out for the very last point. In that case, it would be heat flux out joule per second. The very last one would be the number of cells time IDX plus one is equal to thermal conductance watt per meter square per Celsius times from here it would be the uh, KT4 the T4 which could be copied from here so let's op maximize it maximize it and then yeah so the very last one is actually number of cells yeah 
minus t bottom t bottom says Celsius times delta x and delta y yeah so that's basically the heat flux out and we need to use the same pattern to get it done for the heat flux in but the loop is going to be different so it starts from 2 to number of cells which is number 4 right and we could somehow make use of the line we did before and make a slightly change to make the in working for us and instead of out we will have in yeah so we first get those ones down and then later on look at what is the equation that we need to be working on same equation but different indices so q in i is equal to i minus 1 so in that case here we will need space index minus 1 and the second one is going to be space index only which is ti here right so that's basically the equation we need to look for the heat flux in and same thing applies to the boundaries so for the boundary what we have is going to be the very first value so in that case here is going to be 1 at the time index i plus 1 same thermal conductance but the the first value we are going to use is going to be t surface c yeah minus the temperature at the very first point so that basically is the solution for working out all the flows and now we need to solve the problem and the way of solving the problem is do another space loop for space id x is equal to one to number of cells so this time it needs to go from the very beginning to the end because this is the number of stock we need to go through and the equation we need to look at is basically the equation we have it here that means t underscore temperature array space idx time idx plus one which is to prepare for the next time step is equal to first is the q in and q out so it's going to be q in minus q out we can do that give a little bit more space because this is the equation that we need to follow up yeah so q in minus q out which is this one here heat flux out yeah and then times time step Yeah, so which is being specified here yeah. and after the time step is going to be the heat capacitance which is this number here and that divided by dz underscore m dx underscore m 
dy underscore m. And after that, it has to be added by the previous time step, which is the value here. And instead of time index one, we've got this number here. So here is the finish of the next time step. And after that, you will repeat, repeat, repeat until you get the solution. Now, one more thing. We need to plot the result. And the plotting, as we discussed before, could be done by two ways. One is to look at the problem from this direction. So which is to look at the change over space at a specific time. The second way is to look at the property over time at a specific location. So we basically need to have two graphs. And the way of doing so, first of all, we specify a time S array. Second array, this is equal to zero time step S and then time step S uh, max time steps minus one. Yeah, so this basically is the array for this one here. So this is the 1D array and that basically specify the time point. The second one here is XM array. And this start from zero to DZ underscore M, DZ underscore M times the number of cells minus DZ underscore M. All right, so that's the number of X point. And then we need to show the figure. So FIG is equal to figure. And to be able to show the figure in a background, what you can do is set GCF, which is the current graph uh, color white. Okay. And then we've got subplot. Two rows, one column. Look at the very first one. And then we've got plot x underscore m array, which is the x axis. Then we look at temperature di distribution at a specific time point. So let's say we will look at the very first time point. And in that case, we specify this as a red line. And we will show from the legend that time is equal to zero, which is the beginning of the whole soil depth. And we want to have the line width a little bit thicker is equal to two. All right. And if we want to draw few, then we need to have the hold on, right? So copy this one and paste it. And the second one is going to be a little bit different. So in that case, we can use the green. And instead of looking at the second point, we're basically looking at the uh, second day. So the second day is going to be 24 times two. Why is that? Because remember our time step is actually one hour. So the two days after the, the uh, simulation started is going to be 48 hours, which is 24 times two. And then this one, the display name could be two days. What we could do for the very last day is going to 24 hours times 10. And then this one could be blue. And then this is 10 days, right? So the 10 days again is calculated by the time step one hour times 24, which is one day and then times 10, which is 10 days. So that shows this. 
We can try to run that and see what it looks like. Perhaps um, it works. Now we've got an error. We need to find out what is the problem, right? So the index uh, exceeds a rebound. So that is 942 and that's here. Okay, so this one is going to have a multiplication which was forgotten. Oh, okay, so this result looks not too bad because this is the soil surface. This is basically the soil bottom. This is 0.6 meters. And the temperature changes from 30 degree to 15 degree as expected. And the red point, remember, was the time zero. And the second is two days, which is the green line. And the blue line is basically 10 day result. So that somehow shows exactly the result that we would like to see. So we keep going, we keep going with it. After having this, what we want, we need to have a label. So let's say X label is going to be depth. The Y label is going to be temperature. And what we could do is basically draw a small circle, C, which is the unit for temperature, Celsius, by using the format like this. And we want to show the legend. Right. Now, this is basically look at the result over space at a specific location. If we go back to the graph we have here, which is this, this, and the very last line. Again, we can look at the problem by looking at the, the one point change over time. So this is going to be the second plot. The second plot is going to be done by almost like copy and paste, right? So instead of plotting to the first location, we are going to look at the second location. We need to basically look at this as time second array but then if we look at the axis as second it's not that easy to understand so what we can do is basically uh, define a another value say day per second and this value is going to be one divided by eight six four double zero right so you can consider this as a unit conversion parameter. So if you multiply this by this parameter, you will change the timeline from second to days. So the P basically you could consider it as a split. So the one on top is the numerator and the S here is denominator and the S is going to be canceled out by the S here. So by looking at the equation, you see the unit ends up with a day. And these ones also need to be replaced. Now we need to change this slightly. So instead of looking at space, we are basically looking at time change. So for the point here, we basically look at, say, number one, number three, and the very last one, right? So in that case, here would be 0.6 and this is 0.8. So 0.6 and 0.8 meters. Is that all? One more thing actually, which is to change the legend. So the X label no longer become depth, it's actually time. And the unit as specified about is actually days. And Y is still temperature. What we could also do is to print them out. So P print FIG result dot JPG. The type of uh, output is going to be DJPEG. And the uh, resolution 
is going to be 200. So in that case, you will produce a result.jpg file that will store the uh, plotted results. So let's run it and see how it goes. Right. How to understand this result? This result basically tells you that the temperature at the beginning is 15 degree all the way from the surface to the bottom. And later on, because of the temperature on the surface is increasing, eventually the temperature after 10 days, the surface becomes 30 degrees Celsius and the bottom becomes 15 degrees Celsius. But if we look at the uh, temperature change over time for the uh, surface, it started increasing from 15 to 13 almost immediately. Whereas for the second, which is 0.6 meters below the surface, the temperature increases, but the intensity becomes much smaller as compared to the surface. And also it takes relatively longer days to reach a steady state condition. And if you look at the boundary, 0.8 meters below the surface, you can see that still it's slightly higher than 15 degrees Celsius, but the uh, change intensity is much less as compared to the surface because the heat source is far away from that point, isn't it? This is how the result look like. Oh, there is one that is not working. So it says that print is not functional. The JPEG, sorry, it's JPEG. So if we print this, we'll be able to have a result from the place where we do the calculations. So let's go here and then we could go to the folder where the current working directory and double click the JPG file and we'll be able to see the result is stored in the high resolution. And now let's look at a bit sensitivity analysis. The first one is to ask to change the conductance. So what we'll do here is that we save those ones into separate files. So save as, okay. And then we basically change the conductance value. So originally the conductance value was 100. So we changed the conductance to 50 and then run the program again. And now if we compare this to the original result, what we will see is that the surface temperature is slightly less as compared to the conductance that is 100. So let's, let's try to even decrease it further. So we say this is original is one, original is 100. Right, so let's try to change that to 10 and then look at the result. What you will see is that the system actually doesn't move the temperature to 30 degrees Celsius at all. Instead, the steady state was roughly 28 degrees as compared to 30. What we can do here is that we copy those temperatures to different graphs. So what we can do here is using the click button, um, click this button, and after clicking this, you can double click this graph here. So it will show a, a editing interface. And within here, you can compare the results. We will also need to open up this one here as well. So you see that the figure one and figure two comes all together. And if I try to move the figure one to a dash point and then move it to figure two, you will see that because of the heat conductance has been changed dramatically, uh, reduced dramatically, the heat injection from the surface to the soil becomes much slow. As a result, the surface temperature will never reach 30 degrees Celsius. And this is the expected result. And the same problem will happen for the subordinate um, 
soil. So let's say we change this into a dash line and then copy and paste to another graph the original result you will see the value has been changed accordingly so for this property here it doesn't change much because heat, heat conductivity within the soil doesn't change so as long as the soil uh, received the temperature from the surface the the heat transport is the, still the same as the previous cases right so that's basically one of the uh, sensitivity analysis we can do the third one here is the uh, initial temperature. So let's say instead of the initial temperature as 15 here, right? Let's change it to 20. So let's do it original is 15. We just do a mark and then just change the value here. So let's say 20 and then run the program again. And after running the program, what you will see is that, of course, the initial temperature is being changed to 20 degree, but the final solution actually didn't change at all. It is still starting from 30 down to 15 degree. And this is understood by the property change over time. When you see the point at the surface, you will see the temperature still going up to 30 degrees Celsius immediately. Whereas the soil at the very bottom depth, the temperature will drop from 20 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees. The conclusion is that for this problem, the initial condition doesn't actually change the steady state condition at all. We could also put this one into a dot point here to uh, the very first figure so so that we are able to look at the result from one graph right so this graph actually starting from that point and the second value here is going to be this one so we change that to um, dot, dots here and then copy it into basically figure two yeah so that basically shows how the result change over time. We can push this one a bit outside and then move it in here. So you can see that it's kind of quite inter interactive way to do the editing. So the number three here, we could also add it in like this way and then copy it to here. So you will see that the initial temperature takes off from 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, the surface temperature and the bottom temperature obviously will change the points where it will end up with. So we can do that one relatively quickly. So we just change that back to 15 first and then move the temperature to 15 degree or this one to say 30, right? And run the same program, you will see that the steady state condition is driven by the T surface and the T bottom, right? So 15 degree corresponds to that value, 30 degree corresponds to that value, even it start from 15 degree, they will always find out their steady state condition. One more thing we could give it a try is that we try to increase the number of cells. So to be able to calculate by eight cells, the D at Z changed down to 0.1. We need to check whether the results still look the same. And the good thing is that the program at the very bottom has been organized quite well so that we don't have to change it here. We basically just change the property from the top and then we can run it again and see whether we got the result. Oh, there is a bit fluctuations, see? It's because of the violation of um, the cruel number. And this could be reduced simply by reducing the time steps. So let's say, the time step here changes to 30 and then you will see that it's being smoothed yeah we'll discuss that later on but look at the problem right now so it still changed from 50 to 30 and the value over time is still quite similar so you will see that same problem 
by changing the uh, time steps, it wouldn't change the result at all. It wouldn't, it shouldn't change the result. The result needs to be independent from the initial conditions. So go back to the previous temperature and surface. So original is actually 30 and this original is 15. So we just change it back and then make another comparison. So this is 13 and this is 15. Yeah, so click exactly the result. Yeah. So as compared to the original value that is here, right? So it needs to be the same. Uh, that's not the one, this is the one. So if we look at the program, there is slightly change. The number two here, you will see that the number two somehow becomes different as compared to here. And this is simply because we refine the time steps. So this no longer represents two days, it's actually one day because the time step is being reduced. This is basically half an hour. So the second calculation is going to be actually one day rather than two days. So if you want to look at the two days, you actually need to do times four here. And that will look quite similar to the previous calculation we had before. So it's quite similar. The same thing applies to uh, the space derivations as well. So this one no longer corresponds to 0.6 meters anymore if you have a relatively uh, smaller spatial discretizations. So be careful when you change the time steps, the corresponding uh, distance would be changed accordingly as well. But nevertheless, your result shouldn't be affected by the boundary conditions. One extra thing that I would like to pinpoint is that um, the temperature at 0.7 meters below the surface is 15 degree, whereas from the projected description, we were talking about having temperature at 0.8 meters below the surface as 15 degree. This is simply because eight cells could only stretch up to 0.7 meters. If we want to show where the uh, cells are located, we simply put a display for all the values that change over space and plot it. What you will see is that, that the total number of cells is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we want to make sure that the 0.8 meters below the surface is uh, 15 degree, the total number of cells or node will be nine instead. So we can try the program again and you will see that 0.8 meters below the surface is exactly eight degrees Celsius. And this is the number that we need to stick into, right? Now let's move to the next slide. In this slide, we are trying to convert the mass balance equation into a partial differential equation form. For the first equation here, we've got the change of heat storage over time. The middle part and the right hand side is flow times delta T. So this flow is basically the volumetric heat flow times delta T, which ends up with the storage. And on the right hand side, we've got the heat flow equation times the surface area times delta T. And the little Q here could be represented by lambda soil Ti plus one minus Ti over delta Z. Remember we discussed before that uh, we intentionally arrange the both numerator and denominator in a way that properties are calculated from downstream to the upstream. So let's quickly look at here. So Ti plus one is actually the temperature at downstream. Ti is the temperature from the upstream. Delta Z is basically the coordinate of Z downstream minus the coordinate in the upstream. So this basically will be able to be replaced by a partial differential equation form later on. 
if we cancel out the delta x and delta y on both sides of the equation, we get the below equation here. And now our target is to move the delta t to the left hand side, the delta z to the right hand side. We get this equation literally, right? Now it's the time for us to put in partial differential equation form. So one thing is that if we assume the second order derivative is negligible based on Taylor series, the partial differential equation form could be simplified by the equation on the right hand side. And the condition is that all the properties are derived from downstream property minus the upstream properties. So the t we've already discussed before. So t at m plus one is actually uh, the downstream. If we look at the time axis and the tn is the upstream. Delta t is the same. So delta t is basically the time point at the downstream, which is m plus one minus tn, which is the upstream. So that ends up with a positive value. We've already discussed this one here as well. If we put these two equations into this one, we will see that this part has been replaced by this equation here, which is the reason why we have this one here. And this bit will be replaced by dq dz. dq dz is actually this bit, and q is here inside. And now, the lambda soil is a constant. It doesn't change over z, which means that we can put the lambda soil outside of the equation. The second part is that we've got two negative symbols, and these two negative symbols could be cancelled out, and then we basically get a lambda soil double derivative of t with respect to z, and that's basically the governing equation. So here and here, this is the governing equation. Now, once we get this governing equation, we can try to figure out whether there is a specific analytical solution for this problem. In our problem, what we have is that um, the temperature from the top and to the bottom is all constant values. And in that case, at the steady state condition, which is shown from the graph we had here, is that these values eventually will not change over time. It will change over time at the very beginning because the initial value is different from the steady state condition. But once every point has reached the steady state condition, it doesn't change over time, which means that the temperature at each point doesn't change over time at steady state condition. So if that's the case, the right hand side of this equation here is equal to zero. If that's equal to zero, we can derive that the change of the temperature with respect to space is a constant. And if we further do an integration, then temperature is equal to C1z plus C2. And if we can define the C1 and C2 here, we literally end up with an analytical solution for the steady state condition. So we put in z is equal to zero, then the temperature is equal to 30. And the other one is on the other side, we can end up with the solution. This solution is linear solution. If we look at the result we had before, the line after 10 days becomes almost in a linear fashion. And once z is equal to zero, temperature equal to 30, where once the z is 0.8, this one is exactly 15. So numerical solution is exactly the same as compared to the analytical solution, which means that our numerical derivation is um, correct. Once we derive the steady state analytical solution, it doesn't really tell us about how the property change from the initial condition to the steady state condition because in the steady state condition, we'll be assuming that temperature doesn't change over time. So this bit could be ignored. This steady state condition is independent from the choice of initial condition anyway. So even if it started from different initial condition, it will always reach the same solution. Now let's move to update of the existing problem where the update are all highlighted in red. 
So instead of having a constant temperature on the surface, the surface temperature is described by T as a function of time is equal to mean temperature, temperature amplitude times cosine. This is frequency because it's 2 pi over a period times time. Mean temperature, which is 15 degree. Temperature amplitude is basically 10 degrees Celsius. So basically the value changes from 25 to 5 degree, which is pretty much like the daily change of temperature. P is basically the period. And this number is the number of seconds within a day. Conductance has been changed to 150. Other than those things, the rest of the problem is the same. So we expect that the temperature fluctuation is taking place near the surface. This will affect the result downstream. The temperature will change not only to space, but also to time. The temperature fluctuation is supposed to be reduced over distance and eventually becomes almost a constant value, which is controlled by the T-bottom. And we'll try to implement that numerical solution. So go back to the problem we had before. So what we are going to do is to put this one to the left-hand side. We put our MATLAB script on the right-hand side and try to derive it. So what we're going to do first is to make sure that this bit has been specified properly as the preparations. So what we need to put in here is a period of temperature is equal to 60 times 60 times 24, which is literally the number we have it here. 86400 and then we have our angular frequencies this one is equal to 2 times pi over period and the next one that we need to define is um, the temperature mean surface is 15 degrees and then T amplitude surface as 10. After we specify this, we can put in the actual temperature on the surface. So will that be in here or it has to be within the for loop? The answer is actually here because this one needs to be calculated every single time step. What you could also do is that you could predefine an array with the same size as the maximum time step with all the temperature on the surface well defined before you put into the loop. But for this example here, we uh, tend to just put it in within the loop and we update every single time. So first thing is time. S is equal to time step second times time index. That's what is exactly the right time at the current time index. And then we use that equation here, specify that T surface C is equal to T mean surface Celsius plus T amplitude surface C times cosine 2 pi over periods Basically, is the angular frequency, N-G-U-L-A-R-F-I-E-Q, times time S. If we look at the equation, basically everything here is a scalar, which means that we will end up with a scalar. And the T-surface has already been put into the T-surface in the first heat flux in.
which is here, then the T surface here could be commented out. But if you don't comment it out, they will be replaced down here anyway. And basically, we can rerun the program. This is not going to be 1.6 anymore because the number, th the, the third point is actually 0 0.2 meters, isn't it? Yeah, and also space. This is actually depth. So we can change it, make it relatively neater. And cancel this out. We could also put this one to the outside of the domain. What we could do is basically legend location east outside. And that gives a bit more space for us to review the result. And as we can see that the temperature fluctuates and the fluctual intensity is quite high near the surface and the depth over depth the fluctuation becomes smaller and there is slightly phase change as well because the peak used to be here but later on moves a little bit behind whereas if we look at the temperature at 0 0.8 meters below the surface we pretty much see a constant value what we could also see from the up result is the temperature profile over uh, distance at a specific location. So time at zero is this point. And once it's two days, I think it overlaps with the 10 days result. We can basically delete that and see overlap. And the reason they overlap is because the phase is exactly at the days and then they are exactly the same. But what we expect is that this value here will fluctuate during the day at some point the actual temperature has shifted below the 15 degree so we could expect a fluctuation at different time stage so if you really want to show basically the envelope of the temperature what you can do is calculating the maximum so in that case plot x m array max t c array for t c array the format is actually row for x column for t what we want for the max value is actually in this direction so we want to get basically the maximum value of all time for every single point. So in that case, we need to transpose the equation because if we do the max, they basically look at the maximum value in the column wide. So if we basically transpose that, we got the maximum value over time, right? And we can put this one as, so magenta star, and we can display it as max envelope max envelope and hold on and of course we need to enlarge the line width as well the other one is actually the minimum envelope. So instead of max, we do min. Let's say this is some um, cyan and this is minimum, right? And then we can run the program again. And what you will see is that um, it basically shows the maximum value and the minimum value at a specific location over time. And that will envelope all the temperature associated with this cell. What you could identify here is that um, the maximum temperature at the upstream doesn't really reach 25 degrees Celsius, whereas it's slightly smaller. And that's simply because 
that uh, the conductance at the boundary is not large enough. And if we go back to the problem, we can see that this number has been increased up to 150. So we really should increase that value a little bit. So go back to the code and change that value from 100 to 150 and you will see that the temperature actually increased a little bit towards that. So compare with the previous result, you do have experienced a little bit shift up. If you really want to reach 25 degree, I believe the number that we need to stick into would be around 200. We can try 180 and see if it is able to reach around 25 degree. What we find is that the solution does not stick into 25 degree. Instead, we find that the result becomes a bit funny here. And once you see this kind of result, this simply means that um, the choice of delta t and delta x doesn't follow the cool number criteria. The way to resolve this really is to reduce the time step. So if we reduce the time step down to 20 times 16, then we can see that the result becomes much smoother and also the temperature sticking to the upper and lower boundary as we expected. Right, this is basically the way how we can further adjust the boundary condition by changing the heat conductance. So if we move to the next one, what you can see that the first thing we need to do the sensitivity analysis is to change conductance. The initial temperature will also affect how the initial stage is looking at. So at the very beginning, the phase starts from here, but the phase could start it from 20 degrees Celsius, but at steel, we would fluctuate between 25 and 5 degrees. The volumetric heat capacity and in the, the conductivity would change the temperature distribution within the domain. We can try that. So instead of 2, we can put this number into 1 and then try to run the program again. And what you will see is that um, the decrease of the temperature becomes more flattened. So the way of comparing this is to put the new result to the previous results. You will be able to see that the after changing the heat conductivity into a smaller value, the temperature decrease over time becomes much quicker because it's becoming more difficult for temperature transporting to the deep soil layers. And this is how the volumetric heat capacity will be changed the result. For the surface temperature change, the amplitude would affect the upper and lower bound. And the bottom temperature is to specify what is the temperature at the very bottom. The final one here is an analytical solution. So even for this problem that the temperature change over time and change over space, we do have an analytical solution, which is amazing. So we try to put in that and compare with the result. Okay. So before we do so, we need to put these numbers back and this equation could be implemented in the initial preparation time place, right? Which is here. And it's a function of Z and time. So we need to have a time array. And previously the time array is being defined here. So we want to move it up to here so that we can do the calculation. What we find is that um, the square root here has been repeated twice. So we can define something called a temp, which is a temporary negative SQRT, which is the square root of angular frequency divided by 2 divided by the alpha. And alpha is the lambda soil over the heat capacity of the soil. Thermal 
conductivity yeah, times volumetric heat capacity and the unit is this one here Yeah, so that's basically the temp. We will have the Z at different time points. So let's say Z is equal to zero. Then T analytical Celsius array zero meters is equal to T amplitude surface Celsius times EXP exponent TEMP times Z which is zero times cosine angular frequency times time second array which will end up with our array time plus temp times z plus t mean temperature yeah so that's the equation and not only this one we could try to put z is equal to 2 and z is equal to 8 and once we got that value 2 meters and 80 meters we basically would like to plot them into the change over time so what we can do it here would be say this one here by that R and one more thing that we may need to do here is that uh, we don't really need to plot that many results out here so we want to plot every eight points and this could be done by one eight and so we just want to plot every eight point and instead of plotting a line we want to plot a circle and um, display name depth a and a depth is equal to zero there's no line hold on right and then becomes easy so say zero two meters and eight meters So R, G, and B. Now it's to give it a go. And see how the result works. We got an error. We need to fix the error. So what does it say? Angular frequency has not been defined. The angular frequency Ah, okay, the angular frequency is actually FREQ here, right? So we fix that and do it again. Oh, that's good. So we got the result already. And as you can see that the initial value at the beginning, the numerical solution starts from here, but the analytical solution starts from the top point but nevertheless it catch up very quickly and then it follows that pattern the middle point it's not being displayed properly so we need to look at the middle point problem so so give it a try 
so it's always 15 degrees Celsius and that's not right and oh okay so this is actually 0 0.2 yeah and here is 0 0.8 right that will make the result much better so as you can see that um, the analytical solution matches quite well with the numerical solutions which is which is also expected but also suggests that numerical implementation is quite right unfortunately there are not so many partial differential equation that comes with analytical solution but we intentionally choose this one so that you can compare your analytical solution with the numerical solution to justify the result now let's move to the next slide as what we can see here is that um, uh, there are a few parameters that has been used for numerical solutions one is time step space discretization dx the total number of steps as well these parameters has never been used into the analytical solution so what is the choice of those parameters the choice of the time step needs to first able to describe properly the change of the boundary condition let's say for the second example we had the temperature change is roughly in days so the time step should actually be smaller than one day if you start from two days it's not going to pick up the fluctuation so that's one of rule of thumb that you try to grasp your time step the second point is make sure that it satisfied the coolant number so what is coolant number here let's draw a simple graph so imagine that we've got a problem and we discretize it by this number of points we've got a u max which is the maximum velocity within the domain at this u max the travel distance for the time step is going to be u max times delta t and based on the cruel number condition this one has to be always less than delta x so what does it mean is that regardless of where you drop a point and after the maximum velocity we will be only able to see the point either in this downstream section here or upstream section there and you can't see this point travel to one more downstream further or upstream further so that every single time step this point will only travel up to the neighboring points and what if you violate coral number that's exactly what we saw the, the fluctuations the instabilities so we can give another try this time we change the 20 to 60 and to see whether the result is okay you see this result doesn't make much sense at all so that means the choice of time step is too large and you have to reduce it instead if you just make that one even smaller you will always see that the, the result becomes independent from the choice of the time step the reason it doesn't calculate up to here is because the maximum time step hasn't reached to the that point so we could further reduce it and what you really need to get is that the result becomes exactly the same without the change of the numerical parameters and that's the way how you need to select time step for your problem so we copy and paste to another one and still you will be able to see these two becomes the same so this is what we are going to deliver today i hope that you can make use of the knowledge we described for now to work on your project and good luck